scab, I have bipolar disorder, CPTSD, OCD, and anxiety. And I like to list my mental health diagnoses the way other people list their degrees at the end of their name. <laughs> yeah, mine took more time and more money. <laughs> I deserve more credits. Uh, of the diagnoses, I'll be honest, the one that seems to unnerve people the most is bipolar. It's because there's not a lot of awareness about bipolar. When people find that out about me, the first two things they think, bad temper, bad credit. <laughs> and I can be honest, I don't have bad credit. <laughs> exceptionally good credit for someone with bipolar disorder. Like, I could co-sign a loan for anybody in this room. But you better not miss a payment. I have a real bad temper. Violence. Uh, before 1980, a lot of people don't know this, it wasn't called bipolar. It was called manic depression. And I think that sounds so much cooler. <laughs> really, I'm trying to bring it back, babies. Manic depression? When you hear manic depression, you think of the greats, right? You're thinking of Vincent Van Gogh. You're thinking of Hemingway. You're thinking of Princess Leia. <laughs> Jane Pauly. Daffy Duck. <laughs> the best of the best, you guys. You hear bipolar and you start thinking about that one episode of Criminal Minds. <laughs> Not the FBI agents, you know what I mean. There's a bad stigma. I actually like to introduce myself this way. I usually say, hi, I'm Gab. I'm a maniac, maniac, manic depressive. It's so nice to meet you. That's how I know if me and the psychiatrist are gonna vibe, you know? You got a good sense of humor? This could work. <laughs> Because I'm obsessed with mental health, I obviously read a lot of the Bible. <laughs> that book is chock-a-block story of humans in psychosis. I can't read the Bible without also having a DSM directly next to me. Read a passage, diagnose. Read a passage, diagnose. It's awesome. One of my favorite characters in the book VM, Virgin Mary. Oh my god, I love her. VM? Like, okay, I know a lot of comedians have made fun of the Virgin Mary in the past, and their take is usually she's the first chick, the kind of guy in the raising her, you know, her kid, right? She's the first woman to cause a guy to get cuckold. I think that's a very soft, boring <laughs> interpretation of that part. I'm sorry. The first time I read that passage, I was like, yo! VM has type 1 bipolar disorder. <laughs> it's so obvious. First of all, she hallucinates an angel, you guys. Hallucinations are, are normal, okay? <laughs> Second of all, she has delusions of grandeur. She's not just having a baby. Her son is the son of God. <laughs> okay, Mary, we get it. Your kid's the best. <laughs> I actually thought I would give a virgin birth and I would deliver the next messiah, you know what I mean? Like Revelations messiah? <laughs> Guys, it turned out not virgin birth, but type 1 bipolar disorder. So I think I know a thing or two about what I'm talking about. Another character I love, Eve. You guys remember Eve of Adam and Eve? I think they're the parents of Adam and Steve. Anyway, um, <laughs> love Eve. That girl, I don't even know how to diagnose her yet because she's not hallucinating. She's literally talking to snakes. She's not just talking to them. She makes them her fruit monger. Right? Like, how did she even explain that to Adam? Like, yeah, like I went to this walk. I guess I stumbled upon a farmer's market? I don't know. There was a snake. He said to give you this apple. Eat it, boo. Let's see what happens. You know what I mean? What the hell? And don't get me started on Noah and his OCD. Two of every animal. Two of every animal. I gotta build this ark myself. Two of every animal. Jesus. Who, by the way, is my favorite character. Jesus Christ. God. Of all the characters in the Bible, Jesus is the one I relate to the most with my mental health. 
especially that scene, you know, like his um, Jean Grey Phoenix moment, right? The, re the you know, the crucifixion, the resurrection, no Marvel fans, I guess, okay. At least you guys read the good book, all right. But in that part, right before the crucifixion, Jesus displays a mixed state of bipolar disorder. Because bipolar disorder is hereditary, so VM had it, he has it, right? <laughs> and poor Jesus, man, you gotta think about this. This guy is on trial. He's on death row. Why? Because his best friends were walking around town like, yo, I think our homeboy's God. <laughs> and the police were like, that's illegal. Kill him! You know what I mean? And so Jesus has been kidnapped by the Romans. He's been beaten. He's been sleep deprived, which makes you manic. He's been starved. He's depressed. So he's given up, but he's also manic. So he's like in this mixed state. And then the Romans are egging him on. They're like, come on, Jesus. You saved son of God, God. What are you going to do now? Why don't you save Barabbas? Why don't you save one of these thieves? Jesus, if you're the son of God. You know what I mean? They're like Chris Farley around the same. And Jesus just snaps. He's mad. He's like, fine, fine, okay, fine. Save Barabbas. I'll die for Barabbas. And then he gets really manic. And then he goes, no. I'll die for everyone! <laughs> Which is the most bipolar thing anyone has ever said. And I know, because I said it at my dad's funeral. <laughs> now, I want to be honest with you. I'm technically, like, millennial, so I never read the Bible. <laughs> I did listen to the book on tape. Um, I think it was called Jesus Christ Superstar. But guys, it checks out. All of that stuff is true. Oh my god. I had this realization the other day. I, so I take exercise walks for my sanity. And I walk like this because I'm a maniac. And I realized that global warming is curing my depression. Yeah. We had such a mild winter. The first week of April, it was 80 degrees every day. I wanted to be here. <laughs> theater. I've been here, guys. It's so helpful to me. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, Gab, you can't take that stance. You can't be like, if you support mental health, F the plan, right? Because Greta Thunberg, she's not going to let me get away with it. You've stolen my childhood! <laughs> yeah, I did, Greta, but you know what? You're stealing my sunshine! <laughs> Look, when I'm in a down mood, what I need from you guys, I don't want you to text, don't call, buy styrofoam. <laughs> Burn plastic. Leave a carbon footprint for the gab. Come on. Guys, I wrote the dumbest Greta Thunberg joke. And it's not me. I would never write a mean joke about a kid. Can I please tell it to you? It's so stupid. OK. What's Greta Thunberg's favorite piece of music? Vivaldi's Four Seasons on Shuffle. Hey! Winter to summer, where was spring? You get in, it's classical and climate change. It's good. I felt good about it. No, I don't. Um, any adults here still live with their mom? Anyone still live with their mom? Man, I live with my mom. She's a night owl. At least a night owl. She gets up 3, 3.30, 333 three, three, every night. She starts moving furniture, making the garage door go up and down. I'm like, lady, it's been seven years. Can you finally move to heaven? Like, this is ridiculous. So uncomfortable. Especially because this lady, my mom, was obsessed with heaven. Like, she didn't want to die, but she thought heaven was going to be the best place ever. Ever since I was a little kid, my mom would be like, baby, I can't wait to go to heaven. Do you want to know why? Because in heaven, I can finally go up to George Gershwin and thank him for writing Rhapsody in Blue. Won't that be great, baby? Baby, we 
can go over to Truman Capone and tell him how much a Christmas memory meant to us. Oh, baby, we can go up to Van Gogh and we can tell him his water lilies were so meaningful and he's not alone. Won't that be great, baby? My mom thought heaven was Comic-Con. <laughs> was so cool. My mom was like fascinating. She was like a protester. Like she loved, like she she was on TV once in the 70s protesting a senator over a dump. And my mom like she had a GED barely, you know, she had a rough childhood. Like she was tough as nails. And one time I had a gig where we were going to raise money for Planned Parenthood. It was a theater down here downtown and this huge headliner was coming in and she was going to perform it. I was going to get to be the opening act. It was like a really big deal. But so it got a lot of press because of this national headliner. So all of these people were going to protest our show because we were raising money for Planned Parenthood. So my mom at the time was always my date to shows. And she was kind of like a little bit disabled. She had like a, she walked, she had a hard time walking. She had vascular disease. So she used a cane and kind of did like a Richard III thing, you know, to go places. And, uh, <laughs> And when I knew sh this was going to be protesting, there was going to be problems, I'm like, Mom, maybe this isn't a show for you to come to. It could get dangerous. And my mom, the biggest protester of all time, was like, I hope they protest me. I'm going to protest them. <laughs> she was like, I'm going to wear a pin that says they should let Casey Anthony have an abortion. That way she would have to murder her kid. <laughs> She was just interesting. I said to her, no, you're not. First of all, that's too many words. You'll need a sandwich board. Not going to work. The woman was crazy. Crazier is that I wanted to get paid for this gig. I know it was a benefit show, but they were paying this national headliner like 10 grand to money and I'm looking for like, you know, giant, I just want to pay my Duquesne light bill, man. I'm looking for like 153 tops. So I'm like, yo, can I get paid? They're like, oh, we thought you'd donate your time since we're bringing in this national headliner. I'm like, oh, so you think the local comedian should donate her time, not the woman who co-created the Daily Show. I should. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I just kept bugging them, right? I sent invoices. They were like, no, sorry. Finally, months pass. I'm like, anything. Could you just a gift card, something. And they did. They finally sent me a gift card, but to Planned Parenthood. So. Does anyone have Tinder? I need that. Then my old man. Oh my God, I wish you guys could have met my dad. Beanie was the best. My dad's name is James Beanie Bonesso. Undiagnosed bipolar, undiagnosed dyslexic. Also a poet. He had a published poem called The Father. A child cries, a woman stirs. I am here to console, not to be consoled. I am a rock. That was published. That was published. Could also be a Coors Light ad, I know that. But my favorite poem my dad ever wrote was called Defecate. <laughs> and I'm going to tell it to you. I eat, therefore I defecate. I am what I eat, therefore I am defecate? James R. Vanessa. <laughs> but my favorite about my father with undiagnosed bipolar and undiagnosed dyslexia was there was a period in the 70s before I was born. He, my mother, and my four siblings lived in Kennedy Township. And during this time, there was a serial killer called the Shotgun Killer. And he went around Kennedy Township, Robinson Township, and Moon Township. And he was a family annihilator. And he used a sawed-off shotgun and he would kill families. And during this time, my dad made it his life's mission to catch the shotgun. <laughs> yeah. So every night he would go out, 
patrol the streets, he would dress all in black, <laughs> and the weapon that he took to protect himself from the shotgun killer was also a sawed-off <laughs> shotgun. <laughs> now, I'm sure you guys know that being a family annihilator is illegal. It's also illegal to take a shotgun and saw it off and use it. So at this point in the story, shotgun killer two, dad one, okay? <laughs> now, during this time, a neighbor saw a man lingering outside of another neighbor's house. So she called my dad and was like, Beanie, we got him. So my dad dresses all in black, goes outside, sneaks behind the guy, takes his sawed-off shotgun, puts it on the guy's shoulder and says, you better have a damn good reason for being here. The guy defecates. <laughs> Starts sobbing, he's like, don't kill me! Because he thinks my dad is the shotgun killer. <laughs> and this story was told for years as a about eccentric father, the poet vigilante with a sawed-off shotgun. And still to this day, they never found the shotgun killer. And my dad died 21 years ago. And like you, I'm pretty sure he was the shotgun killer. <laughs> so what? I got it. <laughs> That Cyril Weck reference will be for Pittsburgh audiences only. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, I, uh, my parents, I was raised Italian Catholic. I always like to say that because it's different than regular Catholic. Yeah, where are my Italians at? Woo! I got one, two, two Italians, hey, I'll take it. I will take it. Yeah, Italian Catholic, so regular Catholics, the motto is what would Jesus do? Italian Catholics, the motto is what would grandma do? <laughs> <laughs> She died for our sins and a really good lasagna. So that matters. <laughs> matters. Uh, I know it's controversial to identify as Catholic in 2023, and I only do it for one reason, one reason only, exorcisms. That's right. Um, <laughs> sorry, I respect a church that knows Satan can possess your soul, and they know how to get them out. You know what I'm saying? That's my church, baby. I start crab walking, don't call 911, get a bishop, that's what we need. But growing up Italian did this really weird thing to me and it makes it awkward in Pittsburgh. I'm not a huge Steeler fan. I know, I know, I know, go ahead, be mad, I don't care. I was in Buffalo, I thought I'd like win them over with that. They're like, boo! Like I thought you hated the Steelers like we love football, period. <laughs> But you gotta understand, you gotta hear where I'm coming from, man. When you watch Steelers on Sundays in an Italian family, it's different than a regular family. I'm sure at your house you like got KFC and drank lemonade and enjoyed watching the game. In my house, everyone was holding hands, sobbing, <laughs> praying that my dad wasn't about to lose our whole mortgage on the game, okay? And this was the Louis Litz years. <laughs> Do you guys remember like a few weeks ago before Trump turned himself in? He was like, hey guys, I'm gonna get arrested on Tuesday. You guys gotta protest that. Do you remember that? Yeah. Everybody was like, yeah, do you think he's really gonna get arrested? I knew he wasn't getting arrested. You know why? Because every time someone in my family got arrested, we didn't get a heads up, you know what I mean? <laughs> choke laughing, because that's a true story. <laughs> My favorite thing about being Italian, meatballs. I love meatballs! Who loves meatballs? If you love me, you love meatballs. Go buy me meatballs in between the shows. I'm going to back to me. I'm going to get meatball sauce all over the shirt. It'll be awesome. I can eat like six to eight meatballs at a time. People don't believe me. They say, you're a petite woman. Get off my lawn. I eat my meat. I eat so many meatballs that sometimes my tummy even distends a little bit, like it just puffs out. And then I start rubbing it and pretending I'm pregnant. <laughs> With a meatball baby. 
And then I, I like imagine like what would happen if like I could grow a meatball baby inside of me? What would that look like in nine months? You know what I mean? I'd be pregnant with this meatball baby. And then I have to deliver it, you know, and then I'd be at the hospital, I'd be on the stretcher, my legs spread, the doctor would have to pull this little meatball baby out of me, the nurse would take him, wipe the sauce out of his eyes, <laughs> get the Reggiano Parmesan out of his hair, and then hand me my beautiful little meatball baby, and I would look him in his eyes, and I would eat him up. <laughs> That's why I'm pro-choice. <laughs> You're like, what? What was that about? <laughs> Is she really pro-choice? Like, I do shows out in the middle of nowhere, like where everyone wearing Trump 2039. I'm like, that's not even an election year. <laughs> and I'll do that bit and I'm like, yeah, meatball baby, stupid liberals. I'm like, but I said, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I have literally walked into shows where I am scared for my life. And my opening line of those shows is, hey, Guys, I'm just like you. I vote how you vote. How do we vote? <laughs> yeah, that's how I vote. That's how I vote. Vote that way. That's how I vote. Like you, me. When I'm not doing stand-up, I'm a shoulders performer. And sometimes people are like, you just said you're bipolar. Yeah, you can be bipolar anymore with kids, okay? Like that, we're breaking the stigma. But being a children's performer is kind of my favorite thing in the entire world. Performing for kids is so awesome. It's so much better than performing for you guys. No offense. <laughs> no offense. It's not your fault. It's not your kids can be present, right? They can be in the moment. They don't have to worry about getting blood work tomorrow. Right? <laughs> they don't have to worry about paying taxes. I think that's coming up. You know, like it's very <laughs> It's really organic, you know? And for whatever reason, this year, we got into this room. I'm an anti-bully person, but some reason, this year, it's all about chicken nuggies with the kids. <laughs> and it's my fault, because I do this part where I want them to have a good attitude for the school day. So I'm like, hey, who here loves to come to school? Because they love to see their friends. And all the kids raise their hands, of course, they love to see their friends. And I'm like, all right, who loves to come to school? Because you actually have a favorite teacher you love to see. You'd be amazed. 98% of the kids are like, hey, I'm a favorite teacher. They start pointing to them. It's so cute. <laughs> and then I say, OK, be honest. Who loves to come to school because your cafeteria serves delicious chicken nuggies? <laughs> and I say it like that, and the kids go nuts. <laughs> like, even if the nuggies are garbage, they don't care. They're like, yeah! <laughs> They're so excited. <laughs> questions about being bullied, but this kid's like, yeah, can I please, please answer my question. I'm like, all right, buddy, what do you want to know? He's like, I got to know, what's your favorite food of all time, right? He's setting me up. <laughs> so I wanted to make him happy, and I'm like, I'll tell you, it's a three-way tie between dino nuggies, chicken nuggies, and chicken tendies. <laughs> Guys, it was like freaking fireworks. They went nuts! <laughs> But better than that, this little six-year-old sitting behind me got so excited, he jumped up and went, let's go! Yeah, it's been 
rough. I feel bad for the kids. They've been going through the mental health stuff. I feel bad for you guys, because you're like, you like, so a lot of people don't like acknowledge it. Like, you've all gone through a trauma. Some of you've gotten help. Some of you are like, I should get help, but I'm busy, because I'm not. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I feel bad for everyone, but I just think the worst year, like truly, the year that killed us was 2020 to 2021. And I saw like, visual evidence of it on your Facebook pages. <laughs> Anyone that you know that has a kid, they do the same thing every year. On the first day of school, they post a picture of a kid on the first day. And then on the last day of school, they repost the first day of school picture and then put the last day of school picture next to it. And like in a normal school year, it's not that big of a change. You're like, oh, the kid grew an inch, got braces. The 2020 to 2021 school year? <laughs> no, those pictures were bleak. A kid started the year in kindergarten and he ended it looking like Joe Biden. It was like, what the? <laughs> the whole reason I noticed, I had a friend who posted a picture of her kid in the first grade and then next to it was a 45 year old plumber with five o'clock shadow. And I'm like, why are these pictures next to each other? I read the caption, it was the same kid. about this pandemic is that now you all acknowledge mental health. And I am a mental health comedian. This is the first time in my entire career I could be Ray Romano. <laughs> Everybody loves therapy. <laughs> They're like, I'm gonna green like that, Dad. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, working with kids is awesome. Uh, I love kids. I don't want to have them, but I love them. I think it's good to know your mental health and be like, I am not stable enough for a child. That is not something I want to do. Mostly because like when I was a little kid, I would always get up in the middle of the night and run to my mom's room and be like, mommy, mommy, there's a monster in my room. And like if a kid that did that to me, man, I would freak out. I'd be like, oh my God, we got it. So, I don't make babies per se, I hate their necks. Oh my god. <laughs> F you and your baby's neck. Oh my, the moms are like, watch the neck, watch the, watch the neck. It's like, what the hell is gonna happen? Is their skull so heavy and their neck muscles are not formed that if I don't hold the baby the right way, the head will fall like a bowling ball to the ground, stretching out the neck so it'll look like a He-Man action figure. <laughs> I would have a baby. I love human. I'm just telling you. I'm just saying. I do it. I, I'm a god mom. Woo! My best friend pumped out a kid, and I am now I'm a god mom. Clap for her. You did this. You made a baby. I asked them to name this child Gab Jr. That's all I wanted. I fixed them up. I'm the whole reason this happened. Who do you think put the roofie in her wine? Me. Not him. They're like, Gab, it's a boy. I'm like, Gab is a gender neutral name. <laughs> this Gab is, you know what I mean? Like, what the heck's the problem? So they're like, okay, well, he won't have your last name. He can't be Gab Jr. I'm like, you guys are so dumb. I can't believe you're a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Junior is his middle name, genius. <laughs> and the whole reason I wanted this is because I buy all my clothes in the Target little boys section. <laughs> yeah, as far as like, we can start matching all the time, right? We'll go out on play dates, which we do. We'll wear the same clothes. People come up and be like, oh, what's your name? I'll be like, Gab. They'll be like, oh, what's his name? I'll be like, Gab Jr. They'll be like, oh, is that your son? I'll be like, no. <laughs> The only guy who swiped for me was Slender Man. 
Yeah, it's bad, guys. Slender Man is not cool. He's like super weird. He's like, oh, baby, I got this mansion. It's glass. It's in the woods. You can live here with me. All you have to do is have a sleepover with your best friend, invite her into the woods, and murder her a lot. And I was like, Slendy, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> My friend just had a baby, and I'm the godmother. I don't know if we can handle that commitment. <laughs> he ghosted me. <laughs> ghosted by Slender Man. Some of the baby boomers are like, I'm going to have to Google Slender Man. <laughs> And by that, I'm gonna have to ask my grandson to Google Slender Man. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Not you, Ed. Not you, Mr. Ed. I would never do that to you guys. This is my mom's lawyer when she died. When my oldest brother, who I'm no contact with, tried to sue me, he went to this guy. He's like, hey, your oldest brother's been great, great. Love this guy, love this guy. <laughs> Uh, anyway, anyway, back to real stuff. Hey guys, I've been crazy for so long, I know all the different kinds of mental health drugs. Like, they used to have like, you know, like real pills that you took, you know? Like I used to take like Seroquel, 1200 milligrams, Geodone, 800 milligrams. Yo, that would song cute out. I was on all those pills once and I was driving through the Fort Pitt Tunnel and a gust of wind blew the hood of my car off in one <laughs> And my only reaction was to look in the rear view. <laughs> no one was dead, I just kept driving. <laughs> For three months from out of it was crazy. <laughs> Those pills eat my guts. Now they've got all these cool drugs like medical marijuana, shrooms, you get microdose. I love shrooms on my pizza. Anyway. <laughs> I do the medical marijuana, and I gotta say, it's been really good. It's really good. I, I, I've never been able to nap, and now I can nap. I take like three to four a day. It's really good, really good. Bad thing makes you a little paranoid. So the other day I was taking a nap, and someone knocked on my door, and I wasn't expecting company, and I don't have the brain for that. I always assume it's not easy, you know what I mean? Like, ah, get to the attic! So journaling. <laughs> for private property, you know what I mean? <laughs> Say what you want about Catholic priests, but they don't go door to door trying to recruit members. They, I mean, they go door to door because of Megan's law, but you know, that's a, that's a G and I think okay to say. We are good. Oh my God, I, uh, uh, I, was, I was in Scranton uh, last weekend doing these shows, which was really fun, and I was also doing mental health talks, and the weirdest thing happened to me, this is not a bit, a woman came up to me after my mental health talk, and, and I always encourage people with mental health uh, issues to really give themselves grace and self-love. It's really important. Like, you cannot move forward until you forgive you, you know what I mean? You are not defined by the worst of your mental illness. So this is sort of part of my talk, which is generally uplifting. Uh, <laughs> After I do this presentation, a married couple comes up to me with a little kid, and the wife's like, hi, uh, we rushed here after work because he's bipolar and he's in between his meds, and uh, it was really important for us to see this. I mean, I, I just, you know, you're up there saying that people with mental health issues should love themselves and have grace. Well, his bipolar made him do drugs and cheat on me. Oh, shit. <laughs> Guys. I'm so glad that my mental health is in check, because if it wasn't, I'd been like, bro, I would have cheated on her too. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's crazy in this marriage. I don't know what it's yet. <laughs> I just validated her feelings. And then I got interviewed by NPR. Hey, I'm not sweating it. Um, but when I was driving home from that, from that show, I had to go on Route 30. That's, I, and I don't drive that route very often. And there was a hair salon. And the salon was called Salon Surreal. Which I thought was the weirdest name for a hair salon. Who wants to get their hair cut and have a surreal 
experience. <laughs> no one. You know what I mean? I mean, like, and I guess it's because, like, our generation always misused words because that show Dawson's Creek, you know what I mean? Like, they thought they were highly verbal, but they weren't. Because I've always had friends who misuse that word. Like, my friend Josh was telling me about a time he was at Golden Corral, and he was like, Gab, I was at Golden Corral, and this guy at the table next to me, he totally puked. It was so surreal. I was like, Josh, how was it surreal? Like, when he puked, did the food land on the plate like exactly where it had started? Because that would be... That's surreal. Puking. That's a much... But then I'm like, maybe I'm the snob. You know what I mean? What if you actually go into this hair salon and you get a surreal experience? Like, what would that be like? I assume you walk in and there's just dry ice everywhere. You get in the seat and the hairstylist spins it and it's just going crazy. There's a funhouse mirror in front of you. A clown face appears. You leave, walk out to your car, realize you, you didn't get your hair cut and you got gender reassignment surgery? You're like, yes! That was surreal. That's for Jesse. He was like, do this one. I'm like, okay. Jesse. Guys, my whole life, I thought I was a superhero. Like, and if you read comic books, you know that you don't start off as a superhero, it happens to you, right? Either you're a mutant and your powers come forth, or like, your dad dies and you're super rich so you can buy shit, you know what I mean? Like, there's lots of ways to be a superhero. And I always thought it was gonna happen to me, and especially when I was a little kid getting bullied, like, cause that's how it happened in the X-Men, right? Like, that's when your superpowers would reveal themselves. So kids would be like, you're stupid, you're ugly, and I'd be like, <laughs> oh, God, you're still there. Now they beat up more, you know what I mean? And uh, recently, I, I discovered my, my superpower. It happened. It happened at the weirdest of all places, a December's concert. Like, what? That's weird. But I went to see them having not heard their album, and they had this song on the album called Star Watcher. And it's very, anth like it's an anthem. It's like, Star Watcher, Star Watcher in the night. Okay, okay, I didn't do it justice, but that's kind of how it is. And they start singing it, and I was like, whoa, oh my God, I know who I am. I'm Star Watcher. My mom was named Star. I was her caregiver. That's my job on the planet, is to help all you old feeble Fs do your stuff, man. I'm here for you. The other day I was at Giant Eagle and there was this poor old guy, he had to be at least like 48, and he was like putting his groceries in the trunk and I could tell it was hurting his spine. So I just stormed over, I pushed him, I'm like, I got it. And I started putting his groceries in the truck. He got so angry, he called the police on me. I was like, okay, Karen, so I tried to help. I went inside the store, I'm standing in line, because I had to get one thing, one thing only, Nutri-grade bars. And um, the lady in front of me, she had like bigger legs, but I could tell it wasn't because she was overweight. Like sometimes you have bigger legs because you're in congestive heart failure. You know what I mean? So they're bloated with water and it's not anything to do with fat. And so I was like, oh my God, she's probably in congestive heart failure. I gotta check on her. And then I noticed she had like a, a sore on her calf. And I'm really good at smelling if sores are infected. So I was like, I'm just gonna help her out. She won't care. So I bent down, I started smelling her sore. And she grabbed the magazines off the rack and beat me. Because it wasn't a sore, it was a Hershey kiss. I was wrong, it wasn't water weight, it was real weight. And next thing I know, I'm in Giant Eagle Jail, and you didn't know they had one, they do. It's me and all old people that their kids can't take care of them during the days. So they're like, here, Dad, just go to Giant Eagle, here's a dollar, you'll be fine. It sucked. 
what it's like to be Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have a discussion. He had said to me recently, we were watching TV, and he was like, you know, I'm really excited how Hollywood and pop culture is progressing in the sense that like, if there's a film that requires Vietnamese actors, they actually cast Vietnamese actors rather than casting Scarlett Johansson. You know what I mean? Like we're moving, we're moving forward, progress. And but then he said, except with Italians. Like you guys, like J Lo plays Italians, Chris Pratt's playing Mario, Tom Hanks is Geppetto. People still call you guys gangsters all the time. Like you guys don't, you seem like Italians don't care. They don't care if people pick on them. And I really had to think about that, you know. And I was like, no. I don't, I don't think it's that we don't care. I just don't think Italians are the type of people to run to Twitter to cancel people. You know what I mean? Yeah, they, we'll go to your house and just kill you. We're not. <laughs> Some stereotypes are true, so watch your mouth. Uh, something I'm always like nervous to tell people, like there's two things about myself that I don't know how to like just get into a conversation. One is that I'm feminist. I feel like that turns off men. And uh, the other one is that I'm Christian. Uh, and, and when I say them together, it really breaks people's brains, you know what I mean? They're like, wait a minute, feminists get abortions, Christians kill people who get abortions, you want to die, you know what I mean? Like, they don't know what's happening in my head. And my thing is, uh, I just feel like as a woman, I can love my uterus and Jesus. <laughs> because they both end in U.S. <laughs> which is us. So, think about that. <laughs> Say that at church on Sunday, see what happens. Uh, so I am scheduled to be at the gym at 7.30 a.m. tomorrow. What? Yeah. And a bunch of my gym mates were at the early show, and they're like, you won't be there. And because they said that, I have to be there. Now, you know that you can't like challenge me. I'll be there. I'm a manic depressive. I don't have to sleep. I'll be there. Uh, but I, I, I go to this gym for a while, and I was in a really weird position recently where this kid, who I've known for years, we're all working out, and he says casually, like, oh, yeah, I'm getting married tomorrow. And we're all like, what? Jake, you're getting married? Like, everyone got so excited. But everyone else in the gym are normal people, right? So they were asking him normal questions to that comment. And they're like, hey, Jake, so where are you getting married? And where is the reception? And is it religious? And is her dad paying for it? Where is the honeymoon? Questions I never could have come up with, right? <laughs> Doing my squats, mouth breathing, like, oh my god. Finally, everyone asks a sensitive question. I'm the only one who didn't say something. I'm like, oh my god, I have to ask him. I have to ask So I just like, asked the first question I could think of. I'm like, hey, do you love her? <laughs> so bad. He said he did, just so you know. He loved her. Uh, I had this really funny thing happen. Uh, I have this friend who I know from the gym, and uh, I, I don't know how she votes politically or anything, but she had posted an article, and all she wrote on Facebook was, I'll leave this here, and then put the link to the article. And like I said, I don't know how she votes. All I know is um, her bumper sticker says, not a liberal, but I, I don't know what that means. Like, I don't know what she's trying to say with that. Um, and the article essentially was about PETA, P-E-T-A, the animal rights organization, protesting animal crackers because on the box of animal crackers, it portrayed the animals in old timey like um, prison trains with bars. <laughs> that was really damaging to children. And the article was that if children see animals behind bars, then incarceration is just normal, and we have to stop this. And so all these people are commenting on this woman's post, right? And Republicans are like, stupid snowflake liberals, you know, going crazy. And the liberals are like, no, the sight of an animal behind bars is so damaging to the human psyche, you know, going back. <laughs> someone at this point who's like, I don't even care. Like, I don't, I just want people to be nice. I don't care how you vote, be a nice person, okay? That's literally where I am at this point. Do not care. So I 
was like, I gotta jump in here and save the day. That's what I do, I'm gab, I save the day. So I'm like, I'll just write something super absurd that'll just stop this stupid conversation and we can all laugh. So I get on the thing, I'm like, guys, I know what you mean. When I was at clown college, we were protested all the time. And yes, I did throw a cream pie in a lion's face. But you know what? He threw one in mine. I just left it like that, right? So absurd. <laughs> the Republicans and Libertarians were like, Gab Vanessa, you are funny. That is hilarious. You, I want to come see your shows. What a funny concept. The Liberals were like, Gab Vanessa, did you know that dairy is damaging to the system of a lion? You murder it. <laughs> And that's why I don't vote anymore. <laughs> uh, I really promote people to talk about their mental health. I don't think we should be ashamed of it. I don't think there should be a stigma. And people are getting better. Thank you, yeah! Stigma free, baby! This is May, it's Mental Health Awareness Month! It's not a kawinky thing I decided to record it today! <laughs> yeah, man, but I, I find that people are starting to talk about it, but they're still not like, fully talking about it. Like, I'll be like, oh, I have OCD. And a friend will be like, oh yeah, no, Gab, I, I have OCD too. It's just, you really have OCD. <laughs> and mine's just mild. I have like a mild form of OCD, you know? Or uh, I'll be talking to a friend with anxiety and I'll be saying I have it. And they're like, oh no, me too. I have anxiety, Gab. I mean, not like you. <laughs> not full blown or anything. <laughs> mine's more medium level. I have a medium level anxiety. Like these people talk about mental health the way we talk about salsa. <laughs> yeah. And when you have bipolar, it only comes in one flavor. Hot. <laughs> I do have a friend uh, with ghost pepper schizophrenia. <laughs> He's doing really good. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Aaron, am I done proper time? Where, uh, last show, he's like, you... You stop 15 minutes early, madam. And then he was like, will your three people come to the next show? And then Jake was like, hey, should we just quit? And I was like, yeah, let's just quit, guys. Let's just be done with it all. <laughs> and then I was like, hey, could you guys come back? So that like, people, and they did, and it all worked out. So how am I doing on time? Let's get back to the logistics of the world. All right, I don't think I sound like that. Uh, <laughs> oh, sense, Mr. Sense again. <laughs> Wait, what, huh? You're at 43. How dare you? Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't do this in the last one. I love this one. All right, guys. This is about my parents. Please, if you like me, stay with me, okay? Don't get angry right away. Just stay with me. Okay, so I grew up in a household where my mom and dad both hated the police. I know. I know. And when you're a little kid and you grow up in that kind of environment, you kind of just do what your mom and dad do. So if they say F the police, you say F the police. They hate the police, you hate the police. You just, you don't know. And I have to be honest, I was probably 16 the first time I even found out who Sting was. <laughs> movies and uh, one year Sting I guess had written music for the Emperor's New Clothes and he was nominated but the only reason I noticed him is every time the cameras would pan to him he would clap as though he was wearing Muppet hands but he wasn't wearing Muppet hands so he clapped like and it really was making me angry I'm like who is this asshole clapping like he has Muppet hands and my sister was like that's Sting and I'm like who's Sting and she's like from the police and I'm like, I thought we hated the police. She's like, F the police. <laughs> and I'm like, he's a loser. She's like, I can't believe you're 16. You've never heard one of their songs. She's like, you never heard the song, Roxanne, Roxanne. I'm like, stop singing. That's the dumbest effing song I've ever heard in my life. Shut up. I hate the police. You know what I mean? So flash forward during the pandemic, I become obsessed with a show called Only Murders in the Building. <laughs> Best show, man. Steve Martin, Martin Short, Selena Gomez. It is so good. 
But the first season, who do you think shows up in episode three? Yeah, Sting. I'm like, at the police! I'm so angry. And in that show, he doesn't sing Ron Sam. They featured another song. It was like, don't stand, don't stand, don't stand so close to me. And it, that just set me off, man. It set me off. Are you kidding me? If you only know two songs by the police and they're, Roxanne, don't stand. Roxanne, don't stand. Like, you can only write one syllable pattern. You know what I'm saying? Michael, I was so angry. I looked up the number for A&M Records. I called them up. I'm like, look, I don't know what you're doing right now, but you need to defund the police. <laughs> They broke up nine years ago. We're good. <laughs> I, I can do. I can do one more. So I'm gonna end you on this. I. Uh, oh man, I had a really weird dream the other night. In the dream, I was sleeping, which is always a weird thing to have happen, right? You're like, I'm dead. Uh, and then I was awakened in the dream by the angel of the Lord, and, and she looked just like Betty White. <laughs> and Betty told me that she was gonna impregnate me with the Son of God and I was gonna have to raise the Messiah and change the world as we know it. Poof, she vanished and went away. And I woke up and I was so freaked out that morning, you guys. So I, I did what I think any woman in that situation would do. I went right to my bathroom and I took the morning after pill because <laughs> <laughs> it's still legal in Pennsylvania, guys.